Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Deakin University, welcome to Building Startups, uh, the Silicon Valley Bay. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. So uh, the Spark program is, uh, and Deakin University, is very proud to present Hendrik Scheel on building startups the Silicon Valley way today. So Spark at Deakin is a very recent program that was started at Deakin. It's an experiential program that's designed to give the staff, students, and alumni of De Deakin University an opportunity to see, experience, and relate to the early stages of entrepreneurial pathway. So there are several components of Spark, and we've just started it about six months ago. Um, it includes guest speakers to inspire uh, our students, uh, themed workshops to give them specific skills. Um, there's a pitch for which there is some funding um, so that they can get Deacon funding space and mentors for successful startup ideas, and an accelerator mentor-supported uh, team projects with hands-on focus. So if there's anybody in the community who would like to engage with us um, in this program, please do see me or Bretlin, who's right there, uh, or Daisy, who's out there, to engage with us. And we welcome all the community members to engage with us to make our students entrepreneurs. So this event is part of Melbourne Knowledge Week, um, and it is presented by the City of Melbourne. So our speaker today is Hendrik, a Danish senior serial entrepreneur currently living in San Francisco, where he focuses on projects of entrepreneurship, education, impact investing, and tech, tech startups in the digital science space. So he's a serial entrepreneur himself. He's founded uh, two companies um, in IT recycling and design thinking, and he then worked with global research team at Vestas wind systems and became specialized in strategy development and innovation management. In 2010, he moved to Silicon Valley where he founded Startup Experience, a company that del delivers interactive workshops aimed at solving social problems through entrepreneurship. And uh, the, uh, Henrik and Rebecca over here are core to our uh, Spark program at Deakin, and they run the very specialized workshops for our students twice a year uh, over here. So Hendrik now lives in San Francisco, but spends most of his time traveling the world to work with entrepreneurs and educators and students such as us. And um, he, uh, through his company startup experience, he has partnerships with governments, NGOs, and several not-profit profit companies. So I welcome Hendrik to give this talk. Yeah. Good evening, Melbourne. How are you going? That's good to hear. See, I'm still getting used to how you're going, right? I came to the US five years ago and had to learn how to say, how you doing or how's it going? So it's very confusing now I get here. It's like, how are you going? But I'm trying to, now I'm, I'm converted, so it's gonna be very confusing to get back again. But it's fantastic to be here in Melbourne. What a wonderful city you guys have, huh? Absolutely incredible. I've been blown away by the amazing creative potential that I've uh, met among the students at Deakin, among the entrepreneurs that I met both here and down in Geelong. So I've had uh, the pleasure of working with a bunch of amazing students and, um, and also a couple of different entrepreneurs from different community groups at Inspire9, at some uh, entrepreneurship clubs that are just getting started down in Geelong. And there's certainly a lot of potential, a lot of creative potential. Now the next step is just how can we turn these ideas into scalable businesses? So that's what I'll talk a little bit about today. I'll talk about how to build scalable, high-impact companies. And I will share a few insights from uh, Silicon Valley both around how to get started uh, at the very early stage, how to uh, figure out how to validate whether there is a real need for your idea, and how we can very quickly be able to assess which one of the many ideas you might have to go for. We'll also talk a bit about corporate innovation and uh, some of the mistakes that we see in many of the different ecosystems that I've had the pleasure of working with, both larger corporations and smaller startups. So, um, so that's, uh, that's sort of like the program for today, and uh, we'll do this in a very casual way. So anything that comes up, you want to interrupt me with a question or a comment, uh, feel free to, uh, to join. Um, so it's an exciting time to be an entrepreneur, isn't it? There's never been a better time than now to start a company. It's never been cheaper than today to start a business. I'm not sure how much you, time you spent thinking about this, but we are in a situation where humanity is going through these rapid, rapid societal transformations. 
due to these exponential technological advancements, society is developing at a faster and faster pace. Which is amazing for entrepreneurs because there are so many new opportunities. There are so many new needs that could be addressed through technologies that's becoming cheaper and cheaper. And we think we might understand this fact that we're going through exponential changes, but reality is that human beings think in a very linear way. So when we try to project the future, we look at what happened in the past, and then we try to kind of project that linear, somewhat linear development into the future. But that doesn't work anymore. If we're living in a society with exponential technological advancements that leads to society also changing faster and faster. So we haven't quite understood this fact, but it turns out that humanity will change more in the next 20 years than it has in the previous 300 years. So thinking that we can envision what the, what the future might look like just for the next two decades is equivalent to bringing somebody from the 18th century and asking them to predict how we're living our lives today. It's just simply impossible. So this, of course, opens up a lot of amazing opportunity, but it also uh, will inevitably lead to a lot of fatal consequences for a lot of businesses. So for a lot of the business owners out here, we might need to rethink how we can adapt much, much faster so we don't become obsolete. And even employees will need to rethink their own role in the, in the company. It used to be that you could get away with sort of being a domain expert, and whatever you learned in school might still be relevant at the end of your career. So we see a lot of people that said, oh yeah, but I have 20 years of experience as a VP of engineering, right? Or 20 years of experience as a marketing manager for a company. Well, for the most part, you really had one year of experience and you repeated that uh, throughout your entire career. But in a society where we are changing faster and faster and faster, being the VP of engineering is very different today compared to two years from now. Right? So we will need to be much, much better at adapting to this constantly changing environment and being, being able to, to, uh, to stay relevant, because otherwise we will become obsolete. So that's one of the things I work with entrepreneurs around. Well, how can you be even faster at adapting? And many companies ask themselves, well, how can we be better at embracing these radical new changes? How can we adapt just like technology startups? Because they are these scrappy little companies that don't have a lot of resources, and they're able to take, still take a small team of dedicated people and make a lot of stuff happen in a short amount of time. Uh, because of these res resource constraints, they need to operate very lean with minimum amount of resources and only focus on the right things. So we'll talk a little bit about, about what are the right things to focus on throughout uh, the, the talk uh, today. But essentially, being an entrepreneur is no longer a choice. And that's what I work with a lot of students uh, from all different fields. No matter what career path you choose to take, you will need to be entrepreneurial in order to stay relevant. Because many, of, if not most, of the subjects you learn in school today will be obsolete already the day you graduate. So you will need to change in order to stay relevant. And for companies, this is certainly also relevant. And even if you're working in a large corporation, you need to start embracing this entrepreneurial mindset and ad adopting that so you can not become obsolete and not be taken over, because otherwise you might see your, your job be taken over by some 20-year-old who understands the latest technologies, and that would suck, right? Yeah. So the good news is that we're all born entrepreneurs. If we look throughout history, um, Darwin also said that hu throughout human uh, history, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed, right? And what he's talking about here is, of course, uh, the the kind of the skills of the um, surviving species, but those are also the exact same skills that we have as entrepreneurs. Being able to collaborate and being able to improvise. Constantly changing environments, a lot of uncertainty, forces you to be able to adapt. You can't invest too much money on, on one path because it might turn out six months from now that the, the customer needs have changed and you need to fundamentally revisit the whole thesis of your company. Um, but we are all born entrepreneurs, we just tend to forget it. Because we live in these safe societies now where uh, we can just call somebody to fix our problems. Right? So we allow ourselves to specialize in, in small little very specific functions and we forget to challenge ourselves to get out of our comfort zone and also entertain other industries, also uh, see if we can learn new skills that are completely unrelated to what we're doing today. But those are some of the skills that we might want to refine that inner caveman or inner cave woman and start thinking as entrepreneurs and thinking as problem solvers and not just relying on other people to solve our own problems. So 
We'll talk a little bit about different types of strategies, both for large companies and for small startups, but also for you as an individual. Because uh, when everything changes so fast, um, especially for the younger people in the audience, um, you could actually look at yourself as a startup and think about, well, who am I creating value for? What do I want to achieve and what kind of skills and resources do I need to have in order to be able to provide a lot of value for those customers? What kind of revenue do I want to get in terms of happiness, in terms of uh, money, in terms of days off with my family? And what kind of cost am I willing to accept in terms of stress, in terms of having to move away from my family and so on? So there's a, a framework called Business Model U, where you can actually create a business model for yourself. Uh, there's also a book called The Startup of You that talks about how you can operate your own life as a startup. It's quite interesting. But before we kind of get too far into it, I think it's very relevant that I, I get to understand who we have here. Because I think we have a, a very mixed audience, and I would like to kind of cater the talk to whoever we have out here in the room. So I would like all the tech entrepreneurs, all those who identify um, as a tech entrepreneur, to stand up right now. Okay. Very good. And then I'll, you can keep standing. Stay, 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 stay. <laughs> stay up. And then all of those who are entrepreneurs, but not necessarily in new tech. So all of those who are founders, maybe a more established company, but not in technology. Okay. Amazing. How many here are intrapreneurs, so innovators inside a larger organization. Everybody, please stay, stay up when you've <laughs> stood up. So intrapreneurs, okay. So you're working in larger corporations as the innovators trying to come up with new amazing inventors. Great, and for the rest of you who are still sitting, how many of you are awesome, <laughs> creative individuals interested in learning new things and being part of a community? Stand up. <laughs> Great, so now we have pretty much everyone standing up. That's amazing. Now I'd like you to uh, take a look around and give out five high fives to people you've never met before. All right. <laughs> high five. In the back, high five. All right. Very good. So. What you're looking at here, yeah, you can sit down again, is your community, right? This is the community right here in Melbourne. You're all equally interested in learning, trying out new things, being part of this entrepreneurial community, this innovation community there is here in Melbourne and in this, in this region as a whole. And we want to take advantage of that because that's really the essence. Now, I had a chance to work with entrepreneurs, innovators, different types of organizations in about 25 different countries. Home base is San Francisco and Silicon Valley, but I've seen what are the most essential things when creating a startup ecosystem? And that's exactly this, a community. That's what makes it unique, and that's the easiest to replicate. And people vastly underestimate the power of a community where people are willing to spend time helping each other get ahead. Startups is not a zero-sum game. Startups are not a zero-sum game. So, so because you succeed with your business doesn't mean that I won't succeed. It's actually the exact opposite. If you succeed with your business, you are able to raise a lot of money, maybe even sell your business, you're going to become a multi-multi-millionaire, hopefully. And I bet you that a lot of that money will come back into the community, fuel the next generation of entrepreneurs. And that's what happens in a place like Silicon Valley. And that's one of the things that's so magical, that people stay and people want to help the next person. They have this um, idea called paying forward. So. If the first hour is always free, whether you want to talk to an accountant or an investor or a serial entrepreneur um, or pretty much anything, anyone in the community, the first hour is always free. You can always ask for a coffee meeting. You might have to buy them coffee, but that's it. Then you get an hour to pick their brain, not just get their feedback, but they're also willing to open up their entire network and see if there's anyone they might know that could help you. That's the secret sauce of Silicon Valley. Sure, there's also a lot of money. There's a lot of amazingly talented people. There are a lot of large companies that could acquire you or partner with you or buy your products. So there are a lot of different factors that make up a good startup ecosystem. But the most important thing is really that community feeling that we get together every Wednesday, we pitch ideas to each other, we're able to help each other. If I know somebody who can help you, I don't think about what's in it for me. 
I believe in startup karma, that if I help you, maybe you can't help me directly, but somebody else will then, right? So that's that community feeling that's really important and why many of these Silicon Valley startups can get off the ground. So that's really, I mean, of course, there are many lessons we can learn from this place on how you build companies, how you test the, uh, the need in a very effective way, but having that community of people that you can lean on. And that's one of the reasons I eventually left Denmark and tried to go to Silicon Valley to find a community of people that would be supportive. People that would say, Henrik, that's an absolutely insane idea, but yes, let's do it, right? Whereas in many other places, people have a tendency to say, hey, bop, 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 take it easy. Don't think you're better than anybody else. There's no way you're going to become a multi-billionaire or you're going to be able to save lives in, in wherever country you're trying to solve a social problem, right? People who are supportive are the people you want to surround yourself with because it's hard being an entrepreneur. Good ideas don't care where they came from. Right? So it's not an excuse that, hey, we're in Melbourne, or, hey, we're in Geelong, we're not in Silicon Valley, we can't build a scalable business. Of course you can. Right? Great, great entrepreneurs are everywhere, and it's absolutely possible if you have that community to, to support you. So we'll talk about entrepreneurship and the many different aspects of entrepreneurship. So as we could see in the room, some people identify as with being a tech entrepreneur, but that's one part of entrepreneurship. And we tend to glorify that component, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Elon Musks or the Steve Jobs or some of those uh, tech entrepreneurs that founded a company in their dorm room and put together some cool app and sold it for a billion dollars. But that's not the majority of, of entrepreneurs at all. The vast majority of entrepreneurs in the world are necessity entrepreneurs. They're starting a business to put food on the table. They're not opportunity entrepreneurs building billion dollar businesses. But it's also as relevant as you're doing a startup is one thing where you raise money and you try to scale. Being a, um, running a small and medium-sized enterprise where the, the purpose of that business is freedom to do whatever you want, to work on a problem you care about, and to organically grow. That's also entrepreneurship and it's absolutely as good and it, it might be better uh, fit for you. So not all people should go and start a or try to start a scalable startup because it might not be the best fit. It's as good if you can achieve uh, the lifestyle you want, then it's great. Tim Ferriss talks a lot about this in his book, um, Four Hour Work Week. You read that, some of you? Yeah, okay, quite a lot. Yeah, well, it talks about how can you just minimize the amount of time you have to put in to get the minimum amount of money you need to power your lifestyle. And that's really what you should optimize for. So instead of trying, how can I make a billion dollars? Well, how, do you, how much do you need to be happy? And how can, how can I set up an automatic process to just get that amount of money in an easy way. Okay, so what is the biggest threat for larger businesses today? So we had a good amount of intrapreneurs as well. What's the biggest threat for your business today? Innovation? In what sense? Uh, like others innovating? Others innovate. Yeah. You could be gone the next day. Right, so all these smart, nimble, agile little startups coming in and disrupting your industry. It's terrible, right? We hate those startups. It's very frustrating um, when you build up a solid business and a good community and a good product, and then we have a startup coming in offering the same type of service at half the price, or even providing superior value to those customers through an automated process, and all of a sudden your business is gone. All right, so that's one of the really big challenges for companies today, being disrupted. And if you don't innovate, and as we talked about, this, this trend of, of societal transformation is just accelerating further and further. So it's going to go faster and faster and faster. And it's going to be easier to be left out. It's going to be easier for startups to disrupt your industry. Um, we see it already. We see so many well-established industries being completely disrupted. And what, I mean, we live in a time where the largest accommodation provider in the world, Airbnb, don't own any real estate. Right? The most, you probably heard some of these facts, the most popular um, media company don't pr provide any content on Facebook, right? And the largest taxi company don't own any cars at Uber. So we live in a time where many, a lot of this innovation happens not just around the product or service, but around the business model itself. So startups always think about how can we create, deliver, and capture value from our customers. And today, a lot of that value being delivered is not so much around the product itself, it's more about the business model. So how can we innovate around that? How can we wrap some services around whatever product we have so we keep customers coming back? 
We have a high retention rate. We have a high referral rate. So we get more and more money from each of those customers. A great example is always the iPod. When that came out, the innovation around the iPod was not the device itself. It was the business model around it. So instead of selling a device like all the other idiots, because Apple was not the first one coming up with an MP3 player. Right? There are lots of MP3 players that were cheaper, could do the same thing. But Apple had a service around it, a business model where people came coming back, they kept coming back over and over again. And every time you interact with your customers, you have a chance to upsell additional products and make more money on that uh, product. So that's how a lot of these companies, uh, they actually don't have that innovative, much innovative products, but they just do it in a different way. Cheaper, automated, and, uh, and a subscription model instead of a one-time transaction. So many of these corporate innovators, they try their best, right? They, they really try, so they hear all, all these startups. They're making a lot of innovation. They're coming up with new products, new ideas, and they're much, much faster than we are. So how can we imitate that? How can we create some kind of innovation hub at our company? And they try to buy, well, yeah, so the, they look into entrepreneurship, which is the same thing. So looking at how can we be Entrepreneurs, but inside a business, so you have a slightly different situation, but essentially applying the same mindset and the same tools. The problem is that the way they go about this is that they buy a bunch of toys, right? So they hear the startups, they have all these ping pong tables and fun playrooms and colorful uh, ideation sessions with, uh, with all kinds of amazing toys, and then they hope that a lot of innovation will happen. Maybe they even come up with an idea management platform so we can capture some of those ideas and we try to get people to collaborate around it. Some companies have tried some of that. I know I've, I've been part of rolling out some of those programs and it just doesn't always happen. It actually more often than not, it fails because of a number of reasons. Um, one of the things is that we try to take people, well, I think we have top three factors that, that makes many of these corporate entrepreneurship programs fail. One of them is that they're forced to, we take some of these innovators in our company and then we promote them to now you're an entrepreneur and you can run our innovation lab or our global research department or whatever it is that we call it. You basically get a new hat on and now you're in charge of radical disruptive innovation in our company. The problem is that those people have often been in that corporation for 20 years. So their mindset is very much around the core business of that company. That's what they think about, and they will be measured on how well this ties into their core business. So you're not going to see a lot of radical, disruptive new ideas come out of this, because these people are completely tuned into the core business, and the many disruptive ideas are going to come completely out of that. They're not going to fit the core competences of your existing business. Then it wouldn't be very disruptive. It would be some kind of incremental innovation. Second one, sorry, it says one, it should say two. Salary instead of equity. Compensation. Compensation structure. Is that a big part of the entrepreneur's journey? Like a lot of entrepreneurs, the reason you want to make it big is because you maybe want to make a lot of money. I think even more entrepreneurs, especially today, are driven by having a lot of impact. But it's definitely part of the equation that if you do well, you're going to be compensated for it, right? Because you own equity in your business. And the problem is, in a traditional innovation environment in a large corporation, you have your base salary covered. You don't have any skin in the game. And it's very rare still today that we see companies that are willing to give equity as compensation for these entrepreneurs and these innovation teams. So that's one of the, the, the main reasons, right? In, as an entrepreneur, for example, if you've invested all your life savings in, into your business, don't you think you're going to stay up a little longer to formulate that first cold uh, email to those customers? Aren't you going to be a little more persistent the first time you, uh, you talk to um, a manufacturer in, in terms of getting that unit price down? When it's, it's your money that you're investing in that, in that first prototype. Right? It's very natural that entrepreneurs, when they invest their own money, and, and they could risk it all, that they're going to be much more persistent, they're going to work much, much harder, and they're going to put everything into it. And they also, they have the opportunity upside. If a company doesn't compensate the entrepreneurs with any kind of equity, there's no upside in it. On the contrary, there's a huge risk for the entrepreneur that if they choose to pursue some wild, crazy idea, it's quite likely that it will fail. And then your personal reputation is at risk. So not a lot of upside, but a lot of risk for 
going down and spending, wasting money on pursuing a wild idea, right? So that's one of the, the main things. Then the third aspect, of course, there are many different aspects of this, but rigid financial structure and that you use the same kind of accounting systems for the entrepreneurs and the innovation projects that you use for the traditional core business. And that's, of course, not great because if something is truly radical and truly disruptive, there's no way you're going to be able to use the same metrics uh, in the first one, two, three years. So if you measure people on the same type of metrics you have in the core business, they're going to fail and they're never going to get a chance to truly get off the ground. So we use something we call innovation accounting, and we can get back to that later, but I'll send you some resources as well for those who are interested. Um, it's kind of described in, in Eric Ries' book, uh, The Lean Startup. How many of you are familiar with lean startup principles? Okay, that's good to see. About 20%, 30%, something like that. So innovation accounting is a different way of, of measuring the progress you're making early on in, the, in an additional um, kind of product development process. Good. So many of you will know, like, what is a startup? Steve Blank defines it as a, re as a temporary organization designed to search for repeatable, scalable business models. I know this will be repetition for some of you, but it's important to kind of state this before we move on, because the essence here is on searching. Good founders focus all the energy on searching for what we call product market fit. We're not trying to execute. We're not trying to build anything. We're not trying to set up a marketing or sales campaign at all. That's not what founders do in the initial stages. All we focus our energy on is searching for that right business model. And not until we have what we call product market fit can we start building up the real business. So a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of especially these corporate innovation offices, hire the wrong people. Because they hire somebody with 20 years of experience as a marketing manager from Microsoft. Those people are not very good at searching. They're super good at executing and building up sales organizations and spending millions of dollars on marketing campaigns. They're not very good at searching for the underlying need of the customer. And that's really what we need in this early stage. So entrepreneurship is an extreme sport. It's very hard to get to that point where you actually can start scaling up. Um, but there are a number of things that, that can help along the way. People tend to think that it's just a linear path, but of course that's not the case. You need to pivot. You need to Try out a million different things until you get that product market fit and you actually have a profitable business. More like, most likely than not, um, more likely than not, you're also going to fail with the first, first, second, and third type of business before you actually get to have something where you can, uh, you can pay yourself a salary. So you want to get to that point quickly. So Steve Blank, how many are familiar with Steve Blank? Okay, also a good handful of people. He's one of the godfathers of what we call customer development that later on led to the lean startup process. The lean startup process we'll talk about in a second, very briefly, because I know this is repetition for some of you, but it kind of highlights that there are two different stages in the entrepreneurial, any kind of innovation project. There's a searching stage where you're trying to discover the customer's needs and figure out what they truly want. And then we have that line in the middle, so this is going to be a very iterative process where you test out something, you go talk to a million customers, you find out that the problem you thought was a problem is actually not a problem at all that people don't care about your stupid invention, and you need to go back to the drawing table and start over completely. And you want to go through that process so quickly as possible until we get product market fit, and then we can start building up the customer, building up the company, we can start executing on our business. So a good uh, typical example is how you think it's all about publishing and talking about your startup, but good entrepreneurs are actually out there talking to customers, trying to understand what are the underlying needs for this business. First customers will be your best friends. Those are the ones you buy coffee, you invite over for dinner. Anything you can do to learn as much as possible about their frustrations, about their pain points, about their, the way this product affects or problem affects their everyday life, all of those things are going to be highly, highly valuable for us in developing the right product with the minimum feature set that meets the, the needs of the customers. Okay, so there are different ways of kind of mapping out your idea. There is a business model canvas, there's a lean canvas, there is what we call the startup canvas that we've kind of modified and built. Essentially what you want to do is just very quickly, instead of writing a long business plan, some of you might have done, you want to map out your idea in a pre-structured canvas where you describe who are the customers, what's the problem they're currently experiencing, what is our solution for this problem, what are the channels we're going to use to get our product from our factory to the hands of the customers. How are we making money? What is the cost structure? What kind of partners do we need? What is our unique value proposition? All those different things you can map out 
on one piece of paper. You can basically do that in an hour. And now what do you have? You have a plan, right? Solid plan? Now it's just executing? Clearly not. What we have is a list of guesses. And we realize that all we have is just a list of assumptions. So from now on, it's about testing and validating all those different aspects of your business. And we do that through the Lean Startup, where we learn about the customers. After we've learned sort of what is the underlying need, then we give it a try. We build what we call a minimum viable product. Is the prototype with a minimum set of features that would need that we can use to test one of our key riskiest assumptions. The riskiest assumptions is what we should focus on first in our business. It's typically not can we build it, it's typically should we build it. So there are two types of risk in any startup the market risk and the product risk, where the product risk is can we build it, and the market risk is should we build it. Are there people out there who would pay for a solution for this problem? Do they even have the problem that we think they have? All of those things need to be validated first before we start getting into the details of building a product that most likely will be wrong. So this process described in the Lean Startup is where you build that minimum viable product, you send it out to customers, you learn what they say, it comes back from that data, you learn new things, and you go through that process as quickly as possible, every time learning something new, every time getting closer to product market fit. Okay, so just different ways of testing um, your ideas and this kind of a, a ladder. So in the beginning, you focus on interviewing, simply sitting down with potential customers, learning what they say, not talking about your product or service or pitching anything, but just trying to discover what are the underlying needs. Then we can start pre-selling our product. So we can try to ask them for money in exchange for uh, a product that doesn't quite exist yet, but they don't know that. So we're trying to test, would they really buy it if it existed? And lastly, we can try to simulate the service or product we're trying to build without actually building it. So this is the lean way of doing it. Without spending much money or much time, we can try to test out whether we really have something that people want. So a good example of pre-selling is, of course, all these crowdfunding platforms that we have today where people uh, can create a little video of whatever product they have in mind and then set it up on a platform like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Sanjeev, launched a company called Boosted Boards. Have you heard of that, some of you? Electric skateboards? A few people. Um, kind of a cool idea, right? Crazy idea, too. Put a battery pack on the bottom of a skateboard and try to sell it for $1,300. <laughs> so that was a big assumption, right? That was a very risky um, assumption. Are there people out there in the world who are crazy enough to spend $1,300 US dollars on an electric skateboard? They didn't know it. Instead of spending a year building it and then figuring out that they were wrong about their assumption, they put together a cool video indicating how they're going to build it, how cool it would be, and then they set it up on Kickstarter and raised almost $500,000. Did they learn a lot from that? They got a little bit of pre-sales. That was useful to get some money in the bank. What is really cool about crowdfunding as an entrepreneur? You have customers already. The most valuable thing about a campaign like this is not the money you get in, it's the data. It's the ultimate proof that there are people out there who are willing to pay for your product. And the cool thing about the money you get in is that it's not equity funding, right? You're not giving away any piece of your business. You're not giving away any control or any equity at all. You're simply getting pre-orders from those customers that you can play around with. So that's really powerful. Another friend of mine, Catherine Krug, just raised 1.2 million on a little belt that you can put around your back to get better posture when you're sitting down. It goes around your knees. Like 50 bucks um, a pop. 1.2 million in, uh, in pre-orders. That's pretty good proof that there are people out there willing to buy it. So if you can put together a successful crowdfunding campaign, crowdfunding campaign, it's very likely that you'll be able to raise subsequent rounds of funding at a much higher valuation. So that's why people use things like Indiegogo and Kickstarter mostly to validate whether there is a real market need and people are willing to pay for it, but also to get all the marketing and all the exposure. Um, but then you, can, you have that proof that you can now go and raise the next round of money. So Boosted Boards are now doing a million dollars in sales per month shipping electric skateboards. Right. So, and, and then you get into kind of testing all the different aspects of your business. And those of you who are tech entrepreneurs are very familiar with what we call split testing. But essentially, as entrepreneurs, we want to be very careful not to assume that we understand 
how the users think because customers are extremely irrational and they lie to us <laughs> a lot. So first time you go out and you ask somebody, hey, you know, I, I've worked five years on this or two years on this amazing product. It's like it's a clicker you can use when you uh, present stuff at your company. Would you buy this? No? no? But I worked so hard. Okay, so he's an unusually hard person to talk to. 90% of people want to please you, right? We are pleased as a human beings, and we are extremely good at analyzing what do you want to hear to be happy. I want to see people smile, right? So they will lie to you, and they will figure out what you want them to say to be happy, and then they will tell you that. It's like calling up your mom and asking if you're a good boy, right? They will lie. So don't take those initial conversations as proof of anything. The only real proof is um, when talking to strangers and when they actually buy it. So we put up what we call a landing page, and then we can start testing all the different aspects of our business. Should this device cost $4.99 or should it cost $15.99? No one knows. I know that my production costs are $2.50, and then I figure, well, maybe I'll do 50% margin. That sounds reasonable. Well, that's, then you're cheating yourself because you're doing what we call cost-based pricing instead of value-based pricing. We need to figure out how much is this value, how valuable is this for the customers. And the only way we can figure out is set up two websites selling the same product, one at $5.99 and one at $15.99, and then we see what converts better. We get 1,000 people to our website, and we track what converts better. Afterwards, we're going to do split testing around everything around our product. And we're going to measure the conversion rate when we change the background from green to purple. If we are doing an educational app, should I have a young screaming child who's unhappy in the classroom? Or should I have a happy toddler who's out on the playground after he played with the device? No one knows. The only way to, to find out is by split testing it. So that's what we do a lot of. Another good example of how you can fake it until you make it is how Sappas, you know Sappas? Selling shoes online, acquired by uh, Amazon. I believe for $1.2 billion, something like that. Fairly successful guy, Tony Shi. He's an interesting guy. He also wrote a book called uh, De Delivering Happiness. Uh, it's a fantastic read about how to build amazing company cultures and really create happy employees and happy customers. But Sappas, in the beginning, they had the assumption that people would buy shoes online. What's the problem with that? You can't, well, uh, you can't test it? Well... You can't true, yeah, you can't try the shoe. Yes, of course, yeah. So you can't try the shoes, and that's, of course, a hassle, right? Because what if they don't fit? Then you have to, sh to find a way to ship it back. It's going to be expensive, major trouble. So Sapas, well, say that was one of the riskiest assumptions. Well, people buy online or the two concerned that it might not fit. So they went down to a local store, shoe store. They took pictures of the shoes, of like 10 different pairs of shoes. And then they put them on a website indicating that they had them in all different sizes. And then they did some marketing, right? So they did Google AdWords, or the Facebook ads didn't exist back then, so probably Google AdWords. They got a lot of people to their website, and people started buying. Not that many, because they only did a little bit of AdWords, but they sell, sold some shoes, and they wanted to simulate, can we deliver this, this experience to the customers, and would this solve the problem for the user? So now they got orders, uh-oh, we don't have any inventory, because we want to be lean. So they went down into the same shoe store, bought the shoes, Right? And then they wrapped it up and sent it to the customer. Is that the same experience for the customer? From the customer's point of view? As if they had an automated packaging central with, with in, in, infinite amounts of uh, inventory. Exactly the same experience. So we can simulate that experience before we build it. Sell it before you build it. That's essentially the, the key message here in any kind of startup. Then later on, we are not going to have time to really go into this, um, but growth hacking is then what comes after. So initially, you're like, I sort of see this as a problem, and I have an idea on how to solve it. Now we want to interview people. Do they really have the problem? Do they care? Would they actually pay money for this solution? Then we start testing it via pre-sales, and then we can simulate it. When we achieve product market fit, meaning we have a product that people really want. We know we got it because we validated it. Now we need to scale as a business. And that's where startups are really smart. Instead of spending $2 million on regular advertisement in newspapers, they only spend on advertising where they can measure the impact. So startup marketing is very metric-driven. It's not just some kind of 
um, a fluffy marketing person who gets an idea for a cool campaign and then they try to spend money on it. No, everything is very metric driven. So they spend only on the type of advertisement where they can check the conversion rate. They can check how many, how many people buy. Do they buy again? Do they tell their friends to buy as well? How can we optimize that referral group so we get people to upsell our product without us spending money on it, right? That's how examples of how Dropbox reached so mass, such mass adoption that they asked you to refer other friends and you would get something in return and they would also get something in return, right? Hotmail, the way they reached 12 million users back when the internet only had 70 million users in total was that they put a little, remember that? They put a little note at the bottom of your email saying like, hey, Every, so that will go out with, with, in a footer of every email a Hotmail user used. And the receiver will then have a link to say, hey, get your free Hotmail account. Right? So that's a growth hack. And there are so many examples of how you can be very efficient. If you want to learn more about this, just uh, Google growth hacking, and you will come up and you will learn a lot uh, about how to be efficient when you spend those marketing dollars. And this is, of course, something that corporations can also do if they are able to put that innovation office in a separate building using separate accounting and typically also a, a new employees with a completely different mindset. They are able to operate this way as well. Here are a couple of really cool books to check out. Lean Startup, some of you read. The Startup of You, Delivering Happiness, a couple of my favorite uh, entrepreneurs of all times. And The Lean Enterprise, highly recommended to any uh, intrapreneurs or any corporate innovators that are looking at how can we bring these startup principles into the, uh, the corporation. Slicing Pie talks about how to divide equity between the founders of a business early on. And that's one of the typical uh, mistakes people make. They write a contract dividing the equity before they really know each other, before they've really seen how hard people work. And it's impossible to, re to undo. The number one reason that startups fail is because co-founders end up arguing and breaking up. It's not because they couldn't raise money or couldn't build the product or couldn't sell it. It's because of co-founder conflicts. And you can avoid a lot of conflicts by, uh, by using a framework like this. The other day I came, uh, came by a, just, I'm almost done. Uh, I came by this amazing sign. Doesn't it look great? Be patient, it will happen. Do you believe that? No, you don't, right? It made me so annoying. I was having breakfast, and I was like, I was about to tear this, this sign down. Be impatient. Get off the couch and start doing stuff, because nothing will happen if you sit around and wait, because things will just happen faster and faster, and you're not going to be part of the journey. So I have the pleasure here of um, introducing Rebecca. It's a little bonus for you guys. I know you didn't sign up for this, but we actually have another Silicon Valley person Rebecca um, grew up in uh, Buenos Aires, went to MIT, went to uh, Stanford, dropped out of her PhD program to pursue a startup. Uh, so she's been a tech entrepreneur, CEO, and now is an uh, investor, or she is a, is a managing partner in an investment firm called Rivet Ventures, where they invest in startups that target the female demographic. Um, Rebecca will, yeah, you can come on stage and grab a microphone. So. Um, Rebecca has a lot of things to, uh, to share as well, and especially wanted her to be part of the, the Q&A to kind of have different perspectives as well. But one of the things I'd love to, to initially talk about, because you've been part of, you've been instrumental in um, Global Entrepreneurship Week, working with startup ecosystems in Singapore, Denmark, Korea, Chile, uh, Argentina, the US, uh, in many different places. And, um, and if anyone, then you definitely know the power of of an ecosystem. So if you could talk a little bit about that and then uh, also a little bit about some examples of, of investment communities and how that have that rippling effect. And then we'll jump to, uh, to Q&A um, yeah, really briefly. Thank yeah. you. Surprise, I'm here. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Rebecca, as Henrik said. And it is really a pleasure for me to be here joining this amazing talk that we just heard from Henrik. Um, so let's see if this works. What I wanted to share with you is one of the most essential principles in Silicon Valley that makes Silicon Valley actually work. A lot of people think that Silicon Valley is very special because we have Stanford and Berkeley and we have all this money. 80% of all the VC money in the States goes through Silicon Valley to support entrepreneurs. But to me, the secret sauce of Silicon Valley is none of that. What we have is community. 
This is just a graph that was published a few years ago that shows the investments made by early Google employees who later became angels after they cashed out uh, from Google's IPO. So 30 of them got together and started to co-invest together. Uh, between these 30 angels, they invested in 1,000 companies. These 1,000 companies ended up creating 300,000 jobs. All of this in less than a decade. So this shows all of the linkages and the co-investments that went on between these angels. A lot of times outside of Silicon Valley, we see angels, maybe the two or three angels in one ecosystem competing against each other. And they're fragmenting the community. And really, you know, a lot of people talk about ecosystems instead of ecosystems. And that happens quite a lot. In Silicon Valley, we do have those egos, but we know that when the waves rise, all the boats rise together, and that's a really important principle that we follow in Silicon Valley. To the extent that we have mafias. Have you ever heard of the PayPal mafia? It's a group of people that created PayPal. Um, there were about 12 of them who initially were in the original founding team of PayPal. They were, most of them, under 30 years old when uh, they were part of this company. Um, after two and a half years, PayPal was bought by eBay uh, for $1.5 billion or so. And we have some of the most iconic uh, figures of Silicon Valley in this founding team. Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, two of the godfathers of technology in the last couple of decades in Silicon Valley. And they were co-founders of this company back then. So after they cashed out, many of them became instant millionaires after the acquisition of PayPal. What did they do? Did they buy yachts and planes and went into Vegas and celebrated? Well, some of that happened too. Um, all of you watch the HBO's you know, channel, channels and, and shows on um, Silicon Valley and watch the movie The Social Network. So there's a lot of glamour and, and luxury happening. But really, what they did with most of the money was to reinvest it in the community. So with uh, this group of people, uh, they helped the next generation of entrepreneurs. And you can see on the side some of the companies that were created thanks to this mafia. It's a constructive mafia. It's not a mafia that will go and kill people. It's a mafia that would go and actually help entrepreneurs together. So if you're part of the familia of PayPal, mm -hmm. usually you get helped and people will mentor you and invest in you just because you can validate it through this network. And we have examples like Tesla, LinkedIn, SpaceX, even Facebook. Uh, a lot of these companies were created by these 12, I call them the apostles of, of PayPal. And uh, we, we see them interacting with the community. You see them in coffee shops. You see them meeting with entrepreneurs still today, every day. And that's what they do uh, from a point of view of you know, passion and love for the field. And this is really what I would call um, the, the main component, ingredient of Silicon Valley. People work together. There's hyper collaboration. We have the highest density of people and knowledge coming together to the point that, I'll tell you an example, you know, I was um, trying Uber uh, share, uh, Uber pool is called in, in the US and Silicon Valley where you can get on a, a car in Uber and then somebody else whom you don't know can get on and share the fare to a destination. You go to similar destinations together, right? So usually, you know, five, 10 minutes that you share a ride with a complete stranger. And I got on, uh, I was going on a very short ride. So I was talking on the phone, talking to Deal. So my pa fellow passenger finds out I'm an investor. And he says, as soon as I hung up the phone, um, hey, I heard that you're an investor and I have a company idea, so can I pitch it to you? I said, okay, you know, it happens a lot that you go to a place or to a party and they wanna pitch you ideas. So I heard his idea. Fine, I was like looking forward to getting to my destination and he goes, well, actually I also have a friend who's on the phone with me who has an idea. He just <laughs> flew in from Brazil. Can you hear his pitch? And I said reluctantly, okay, fine, you know, I'm here. I, I can't really get out. I can't, you know, jump off the car. So I'll hear this pitch. 
I hear his two pitches, he gets off the car, and then uh, I'm literally coming out of the car, and the driver <laughs> tells me, hold on, you need to hear my pitch, I have a company too. So this happens all the time. You know, it's the hyper density that we have of entrepreneurs, of people who know how to scale these ideas, is such that you, it's omnipresent. You'll find it everywhere. Now, of course, and you invested in all three, right? What's that? You invested in all three? <laughs> I actually talked and followed up and, and performed due diligence in one okay. of the three companies. <laughs> um, so, you know, that level of hyper uh, connectivity and density we have in Silicon Valley uh, and collaboration we have in Silicon Valley uh, creates the opportunities that we see in, in, in the area. In fact, I see the same idea at least 20 times. Every time that there's a new concept and everybody thinks that they are the first people thinking this mm -hmm. one particular um, application of this idea, we investors usually see that idea repeated 5, 10, 20 times. And if you go globally, it's the same idea in every demo day, every single case, uh, with a different name for the company. What's different in Silicon Valley, though, is that we're comfortable with that level of iteration and competition, and we will sit down with our competitor CEO and share really honestly what's working and what's not working. So there's this collective knowledge acquisition that happens even with your competitors that creates the fast iterations that arrive into a model at some point that will be eventually successful. Well, I'll stop with that and I, I hope to have a lot more questions. Um, we have some chairs if you want to just make it more interactive and make it more of a fireside You want to sit down? Yeah, potentially. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, so remember that we become a multi-billionaire, uh, give back to the community. And uh, the last point is so important, we talk a lot about that with, uh, with our student entrepreneurs as well. Like, don't be afraid to share your ideas, right? No one cares about your stupid idea, and it's not worth anything at this point. Ideas are worthless without execution. And you can execute a thousand times faster if you're willing to share that idea openly. Every time you talk to a new person, you'll get a new perspective. And you'll have the chance of meeting that person's connections as well. And that's really how these things happen, uh, happen so super fast. So first question goes to you. Um, I've read that book. Um. Thanks. Um, my name's Ed. Um, first of all, a great presentation, so thanks very much. Um, I've got a question around um, innovation. Um, I've read the book by Peter Thiel about zero to one, where you come up with something brand new that didn't exist before. But do you think there's a massive market, a massive opportunity um, in startups where they could actually do something better than what's been already done? Do you think that, that there is an opportunity there? But the, the, yeah, I mean, it's very rarely actually that it's the first mover who makes the most money. If you, if you look at some of the top companies of today, was Twitter the first instant messaging platform? No. Was Google the first search engine? No. Was Facebook the first media company? No. Right? I mean, all of those companies are, are followers. They just executed much faster and better. So it's, that's why it also underlines the fact that it's execution that matters. But of course, if you can create what's called a blue ocean and you can create something radically new, and Peter Thiel talks a lot about he doesn't, he doesn't like competition. He wants monopoly. Right? And that's, of course, ideal if you can create that, but just don't be afraid if you see a market where there's already competition. And as Rebecca mentioned, like more likely than not, there will be a thousand competitors in whatever space you enter. And that's actually oftentimes a good thing because that means that there are paying customers in that space. There are people that have that need that you're addressing, now you just need to do it better. You just need to out-innovate them. So yeah, it's absolutely possible to start a, a business afterwards. So I also afterwards. have some questions that came through uh, the platform. And there are a couple of really good questions here that I want us to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, so after the initial launch, until what stage can we safely say, OK, I think we need to stop exploring this idea, not enough traction, and start over with a new idea? So typically, in that super early stage of doing customer development, we typically say that after you've done about 20 interviews <coughs> with people that you don't know, so you've talked to people and you've tried to kind of figure out, are there any kind of underlying frustrations and pain points and problems? Tell us about the last time you experienced that problem. After doing 20 interviews, you should start seeing some patterns. 
if you don't start seeing a pattern sort of going in the same direction, and if you don't see people having a, a problem, then that could be one of two things. Either it's not a problem, <laughs> or you're targeting the wrong customer segment. So customer segmentation is extremely essential for any startup because you can't afford going after everyone. So you need to start with a very well-defined niche segment that you are targeting a very specific group of people in a well-defined um, market. And then you, should, you, you talk to people with similar characteristics. And after having talked to 20 people, you should be, be able to, uh, to see some kind of pattern. I don't know what, if you would yeah, agree. Yeah, this is a good question because you know, I, I teach technology and entrepreneurship at Stanford, and a lot of the students will ask me, I'm really confused because you know, we hear often from investors and people around entrepreneurship that tell us, be persistent. Don't listen to anyone. You have to be the, the crazy one who gets it and nobody else gets it. Because if it's obvious to the rest of the world, then it's too late for you to work on that idea. On the other hand, we also hear about customer development. Listen to the customers. Do whatever the market wants. So change, pivot all the time. And so which one is it? You know, do you have to be tenacious and stubborn and, and, and really stick to your idea and guts? Or do you listen to the feedback all the time and pivot constantly? And there's this concept um, of flexible persistence, which is somewhere in between the two. You, know, you do have to do these customer development exercises. But at the same time, sometimes you do have to follow your, your instinct. Um, I think that at a point where you run out, run out of money, your <laughs> wife left you, your parents are calling you every day and asking you why on earth are you doing this, um, maybe it's time to reconsider <laughs> at that point. But honestly, until you, you really run out, of, run out of ideas and exhaust all possibilities, uh, you keep going. Related to this, uh, there's another question that says, um, if people do not know what they need till they see it, how do you get good insight? This is another good question because there is a tension between those who believe in lean startups and customer development and those who believe in the Steve Jobs methodology. He never asked a question to a single customer. Well, he imagined things. I think and there's thought, some discussion around that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he definitely didn't apply a, the no. lean startup methodology as we teach it. Um, he had a, a sense of what people may want, even if they don't know it yet. But let me tell you, those instances of Steve Jobs visionaries um, are very, very rare. When we meet founders as investors who tell you, the market doesn't know it yet, you don't know it yet, nobody knows it yet, but I do because I, I have this dream, that's usually a red flag because it's very rare that you will have somebody who has that perception and empathy with the market to the point that they will know what the market needs before the market does. Uh, so generally, you want to see um, the customer evidence. So let's take let's another some, yeah. question. Uh, thank you. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, I really like the term in entrepreneurs and especially in Australia. And I guess my question is, if you're in a place where needs innovation, but you're actually connected to that, but they don't necessarily know that, how can you change in a company the mindset to say, ah, oh, we need innovation, and then we won't just give it to, let's say, the go-to guy who's been there for 20 years, we'll give it to somebody who's innovative. I guess that's one of the biggest challenges, changing culture, if it's possible. Even. Indeed it is. Um, so who, who, is it who has identified that? Is that the CEO or is that an employee? Because if you're an employee, you might want to quit. Because <laughs> <laughs> battling that kind of bureaucracy, I mean, that's why, I mean, the mindset of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs is somewhat similar. The constraints are different, right? In, in a startup, you have resource constraints around how much money you have available, and how many people you have in your team, and that way how fast you can execute. But you don't have anyone telling you no. In, as, as you probably experienced, in a larger corporation, in that kind of context, you have vast amounts of resources, and you can probably fairly quickly get a number of people to work with you, but then you have all that bureaucracy you're going to fight against, and every time you're going you're to bounce into that wall. And that's why the, the companies where we see the most innovation happening and where they're, where they're able to kind of spin off radically different new products, they typically have a lot of autonomy they realize that you cannot build a new company inside of the skeleton of the existing business. So you, you set it up as a somewhat autonomous uh, company. Some, sometimes you even completely spin it off with a separate brand. 
So there's no risk in launching a crappy product and then damaging the main brand. So that's why there's a lot of, of value in setting it completely different because then you don't have the norms and the belief systems, the accountability, the same KPIs that you have in the main business. Because if you do so, it's just not going to work. That's why you create a completely different company culture around this new enterprise. So they have a different set of rules, different set of mentality, and they don't have anyone telling them no. Um, because doing it inside the main business, it's just, you're going to kill yourself just fighting against that bureaucracy, is my experience. Do you have anything to, to add to that? Or uh, yes, I, I think that um, you, can, you can leave and start your own business, but a lot of times that's also not the, the only solution or a solution that's viable for the person who's inside the organization. We have actually another question here um, that's related. What's your number one tip for creating a startup culture inside a large financial institution, an industry based on managing risk? Um, sometimes I think you can be the champion from within the organization and a, a great way to start doing that is by association with entrepreneurs. Uh, many corporations have engagement programs with startup communities and this is a very infectious uh, type of mentality and mindset. If you meet with them and talk to them and you engage with them on a daily basis, you will see that that culture and the risk-taking mentality permeate into your organization as well. So if you can't leave your organization, like Henrik said, and start your own thing, then I would say find a way to get a little bit of seed money from the organization to organize events where you are putting these leaders and decision makers together with entrepreneurs. Uh, at the same table, in events where they can talk and, and discuss the future, and they will see that um, unless they get on the boat, the boat will live without them. And that's probably the best way to initiate that cultural change within your organization. Yes, of course. I mean, as an entrepreneur, what you would do is put together a pitch, just like you would pitch any investor, and then get some time in, with, with management and try to convince them about these market trends are indicating that this is what's happening. I, based on my competitive analysis, I can see that there is a big gap in the market and this is a, an opportunity. Could I get uh, some free time? I mean, you see Google, organizations like Google and many others that uh, want to uh, encourage that kind of uh, autonomy and, and flexibility because uh, they know a lot of amazing products come out of people's, people pursuing uh, crazy projects. So they allocate, they allow up to 20% of any employee's time to pursue uh, in new innovation projects. They don't call it innovation projects, they call it something else. But essentially, you have 20% of your work time that you can allocate to working on your own project, like relevant for, the, for Google, that, uh, that could become something big. And then at some point, of course, your manager is going to evaluate and see, are you making progress on that? Is it meaningful to spend one day a week on, on this crazy project? But, but, that's, but if, there's, if there's no buy-in, from management at all. If they don't have a sense of urgency that they need to do better and they need to do faster, and if they don't innovate, they're going to die, then it's a very hard uh, situation. Yes. But they don't ask the change in systems Yeah. And that's what happens like in 85% of of all, uh, of all company. And that's also why we see in the S&P 500, uh, like back in, I think it was 1958, the average time that for a company on the S&P 500 list would be 61 years. Today, it's around 15, right? It's a massive change that many of these enormously large corporations, they just don't manage to keep innovating. And after a while, they get disrupted because they don't see, they don't have that burning platform. They don't see that urgency to move. They ignore it for too long, and then it's too late. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? I think it's, yeah. Great. Hello. Um, startups and innovation clearly thrive in disrupting products and services. But there seem to be structures in our society, Western democracy, criminal justice, military, global finance, that don't seem to be being disrupted to a big extent, or at least not in this kind of model. Yeah. Do you think we should, can, is it even possible or responsible to try and disrupt those? Can you your thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, and it's fortunately, it is being done. We just don't hear as much about it. Um, and what has happened over the recent years is like the generation that I see today, so I work both colleges and universities and high schools and, and more later stage entrepreneurs, but especially the young generations, 
They are the most socially conscious uh, generation we've ever had, I believe. They really care about impact. They really care about making money while doing good. And fortunately, there's also this change in, in perception now that it's allowed for more socially minded entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs to also make money. It, it used to be that, or it still is to a large extent, that if you're doing a nonprofit where the, the greater good is that that you know, social mission, then you can't take more than, I don't know, 40, 50,000 a year, right? Um, so, so you have a limit of people that I want to provide for my family and I want to live well too. I'm powered by this social vision, but they don't allow me to do that because people, it's, it's frowned upon. But there's a change in that where you can build a for-profit social venture. Uh, there's a whole new wave of investors doing impact investing where it's actually okay to make a profit investing in a social business as well. So we see companies that are addressing homelessness, they're addressing uh, food uh, shortage, water scarcity. Um, I'm actually working with a, um, or starting to work with a, uh, a department of, of offense in, uh, in one of the states in the US that are looking at how can we use entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking for uh, ex-offenders to help redefine who they are and get a chance in life. Because when you get out uh, after having, uh, having served uh, prison time, you need to check off that box in the US at least that you were in prison and your application automatically goes to the bin. So how can we, instead of having those people go out to a society where like two thirds of those people are back in prison within three years? It's really sad. So how can they become entrepreneurs? So, and that's set up as a for-profit business where you take equity in that as well. So that, yeah, things are being done, but it's, it's slow. But yeah, I definitely believe that entrepreneurship can be a vehicle for massive social change and transformation in many industries. Well, I'll tell you, you know, after talking to many founders who have created billion-dollar companies, many billionaires who have become really successful by um, adopting the entrepreneurial li lifestyle, none of them did it for money. I can tell you that if your motivation is making money, there are so many easier ways to make money than going into starting a company. Um, so the, the key here is that people want to create value and impact. And normally, you know, typically that's going to have some social effect. Uh, and so most instances of entrepreneurship that are successful have to do with creating a positive impact in the world. And I wouldn't even distinguish social versus traditional entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is about creating value at the end of the day. But there are some businesses that have a, a strong kind of a triple bottom line, right, where there's a strong part of it. And, and there's also like the type of the investment community is changing too. Like typically when you talk to an investor, what they care about is low risk, high return, right? That's what's driving investment companies. And they have an obligation, if it's an institutional investor, to return money to their funders. Uh, so they care about low risk, high return. But you do have, especially in the angel community, people that are more driven about their involvement. They want to invest in entrepreneurs that are coachable, where they can be part of it and they can help and they believe in the mission. So, yeah. Next. Um, I'm just interested, in the customer development phase, until you really find that product market fit, if you've got paying customers already, how do you deal with the promises that you've made to them and then you go and pivot? Yeah, you might up end up screwing a couple of people over in the, in the, in the process. That's just the reality of things. Because, uh, yeah, because you might, you, you just need to be driven by, by data. If you're building a scalable startup, then you will have to rely on the data. And sometimes there's also another way to kind of figure out, like, what is that minimum viable product, right? Because some people would like more features. There's always going to be people, and that's one of the typical traps that entrepreneurs run into in the beginning. You start getting a couple of paying customers, and they call you and say, oh, you know, Henrik, it would be so awesome if you just had that feature as well. And another customer would add another feature. And this is just the loop of doom, right? Because you get into this spiral of adding more and more and more features, but it's very individual how many people want those features. So, so sometimes you, you need to just cut it down and figure out, like, because in a startup, you can't build everything. You're not an Intel or a Microsoft or a Google or Facebook that can build very sophisticated advanced products that target a lot of different people. You're a scrappy little startup. You need to solve one or two problems really, really well with a few features. Um, so sometimes you can actually maybe enlist a lot of features in the beginning, and then you start cutting them away. <laughs> so all of a sudden on the website, that function just won't exist anymore. And if only a handful of people scream in the phone, then it's probably all right. You probably don't need to support that function anymore. Now, for entrepreneurs, everything is an opportunity. Um, I'll tell you a story of a fellow entrepreneur who uh, was tackling the, the space of gifts for men. So he's 
a guy who wanted to buy gifts for a fellow guy, so he could never find anything good. Like, he would search on the internet, on Google, and he would find fruit baskets. And he's like, we guys don't like fruit baskets. Like, we want cooler gifts than this. So he actually um, set up a website and put, put up pictures of these, like, very manly wooden boxes that would have, like, beef jerky and Doritos and condoms and like, you know, just like stuff that maybe men would want while watching a football game, right, on TV. Uh, but the, the key <laughs> of this not. was like, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, I don't know what men do. Anyways, um, so the key of this, the, of this gift was that there were these wooden boxes that were um, nailed, like the, the boxes that you would find um, in military settings, like you would have to open that with a tool. And it was like a cool gift, right? And he priced it doing customer development uh, to like $50. He said like, would people pay for, for something like this, $50? And he built a few of them by hand uh, by buying you know, these ingredients for cents and assembling these boxes by himself. Like his cost was less than $5 and he would like price it at 50. He sold out like a hundred of them, and then he would raise the price because he didn't have any inventory, and to like 75, and he would sell out another hundred, and he raised the price to 100, and like, people would keep buying it. So he was screwed because he couldn't really fulfill all of these um, requests and, and purchases. So instead of just telling everyone, "I'm sorry, I just I was just kidding, I don't have the inventory," <laughs> he called all 200 or 300 customers and told them. Um, I don't have it yet, but I will have it by whenever. But I want to know, actually, like, how did you find me? How can I actually add things that you would like for this box? What, what other things would you want here? He used every single one of these conversations as further customer development. So that this is actually very common. Like, you, you can put up, you know, a, a, a website and sell things that you don't have. And if you do have the traction that this guy had, then Sorry. you can use these opportunities for conversations yeah. and further conversations. Man with the cool hair. Thank you. A number of really successful startups that we've seen in recent times, such as Uber, Airbnb, and um, even to a certain extent, Kickstarter, they operate in fairly grey areas of the law or regulation. <laughs> and in some ways, they actually directly flout and challenge those regulations as well. Um, how do those startups survive their early years? How do they not get smacked down by the man, essentially, by the law? And if that was going to be translated into a corporate model, for example, how would corporates challenge ridiculous laws, ridiculous regulations, and, and effectively challenge them directly and ignore them and still actually be able to survive without massive fines? Well, it's still to... Uh be determined whether Uber will, will get away with this, or MBB for that sake, to be or get away with these really radical, <laughs> aggressive, um, uh, not very law-abiding practices. Um, and, and yeah, it's an interesting question, because then you have other companies that spend, spend tens of millions or hundreds of millions on uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility initiatives, to please the governments where they want to set up a factory, like Intel has, has done uh, such initiatives in education that are completely unrelated to their core business, just to create good relations. And then you see these super aggressive entrepreneurs who, uh, who try to get away with it. Definitely one thing that's, uh, that's necessary if you want to do such an act is you need to, to, uh, to raise a ton of funding. Right? But Uber has you know, billions of dollars raised uh, in funding, so they can get away with paying all those fines. So they can say to their drivers that, yeah, you might get fined, but we'll pay for you. We don't care. If, if we'll pay for your insurance costs. If that's so it's, it's a very aggressive strategy. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with it, but they're a $64 billion company now, so they're doing something right. I don't know. I agree with it. I personally wouldn't, wouldn't want to do business like that. Um, but that also speaks to your, your moral context uh, or your moral codex. I think Travelers is, is definitely very aggressive on growth. So on two things. Um, when you have a company that's navigating in a space that doesn't have clear regulation, um, you have to be sure that you have a solution that it truly 
disrupt the way things are done. Mm -hmm. Because once the market speaks, then everything changes. In the cases like Uber or Airbnb, they had a ton of traction from customers because it was more convenient, it was cheaper, and people were buying it. And that speaks, those are voters. And also, the, the larger your company becomes and the more revenue you have, then you are potential sources of taxes as well for governments. And then the conversation changes. Having said that, that could take a long time. One of my partners at my VC firm was in the founding team of YouTube. And she was telling us how initially, you know, when YouTube was purchased by Google, they thought it was the dumbest idea uh, that was, was going to sink Google, because YouTube had so much litigation of people who were complaining on the illegal content that was replicated and reproduced on, on YouTube. And there was a big question mark on whether that would be you know, the, the one investment that would sink Google. But what YouTube did was actually find that godfather or sugar mama uh, that would actually cover you know, the legal fees until the space would mature enough. And that gave, bought them some time. So if you are a small player in a space that's um, a little still gray area, either you raise a lot of funding or you have to partner or be acquired by somebody with big, big muscles. Yeah. How much money is uh, YouTube making today? Zip. They're not profitable. If Google hadn't acquired YouTube back in the days, they would be long gone. Right? It's one of those uh, examples of, of companies that definitely needed that acquisition, because otherwise they would have been buried long ago. And, and I think another point um, to be made around this is how, yeah, because definitely Airbnb has been into a lot of trouble. And if you're navigating that borderline, right, one of the, the big in instances, and there have been several different situations with Airbnb, where people lend out their home, strangers move in, and then they just trash the place, right? They have a massive rape party, everything is destroyed, literally like everything is completely destroyed in the house, and the owners come back, and they're like, where's my house? Like half burned down, furniture is missing, everything is just gone. And in, in that case, and there was like a big um, press story, and in that case, then the founders had to navigate like super fast. They had to be able to adapt instantly and go out and officially apologize. So some advisors were kind of against that, but, um, but th they went ahead, uh, Brian and the other guys, and, and sent out an official apology and, of course, covered everything. And that's where they then immediately uh, sent out a statement that now we just partner with an insurance company and we're covering your house well up to a million dollars, right? So, so trying to make it, it, it good uh, and, and very quickly reacting to those negative stories that will inevitably come, come out. Um, I think actually there's this gentleman up, but he's on his iPad right now, so we'll take you. Well, we have actually a few questions from the audience that have submitted uh, through the platform. Okay. I have a, um, there's a, a good question here I want to answer because it's a, it's a very important point. Um, how do you divide equity fairly um, amongst co-founders, full-time versus part-time? This is very important because outside of Silicon Valley, I, I, my family lives in Argentina, I grew up in Latin America. And we do have, uh, in many ecosystems, this idea that if you're founders and co-founders, then it's like you have to have equality and you have to have the same amount of equity, no matter what, because you started together because you were friends in high school or in college. Um, as investors, that's actually a really bad thing. When I look at the team, I look at the role, the experience of the person, and I look at who who amongst those five co-founders or four co-founders are uh, most valuable players in that team. If I have recognized that one or two are essential and the others are important but not as uh, essential to the team, but everybody's getting the same equity, that's a problem for me. Why? Because the most valuable players at some point, they're going to feel like they don't have enough incentives. They, they will feel like they do more for the company, but they get the same amount of equity and compensation that the rest of the team. And eventually, that's going to be uh, um, an issue of motivation, and they will leave the company. So as an investor, I want equity to reflect the contributions and the value that each member adds. I don't care if somebody uh, is best friends or their family members or their husband and wife in some cases. What I care is about the justification of the equity package versus the role and contribution of the person. So it's actually totally fine for the CEO to have double the equity of a person 
uh, who's not in the executive team of the company, even if they started together. Um, and you will see that maybe in Australia that doesn't matter so much, but if you go with that cap table to Silicon Valley for a follow one round of funding, like Series B or C, um, you will have to adjust that cap table anyways. So blame it on the investor if you want, but you will have to be very honest um, and have these sensitive conversations early on and not apply this socialist mentality that, you know, we started together, we all deserve the same. Yeah. Do you want over here? So, Rebecca, this question's for you. I have a pitch for you. No, no, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that you're a VC, and this might be out of a gender question, but do you find that it's a different world out there for females compared to males in the entrepreneurial world? I'm bringing the microphones over here. We see gender differences. <laughs> um, thank you for asking that question. That's actually a very relevant uh, topic that we're going to discuss tomorrow. And um, somebody else here also asked about why is it that we have male dominance in the technology world and the VC world in particular in Silicon Valley. So let me tell you, Silicon Valley may be great in a lot of things, but there's one area where Silicon Valley truly lags behind, and that's in the topic of gender and women. 96% um, of all investors in Silicon Valley are male, 96, okay? If you're a female entrepreneur, your chances of getting funding with the same type of idea, same type of background and team are usually three to 10 times harder for you to get funding. Um, you are evaluated with stricter terms in general, and this is all shown by empirical evidence. People have done numerous studies on this. Uh, why is that? Why is that we have such a bias uh, against women in Silicon Valley? Many reasons um, that are historical and sociological, but what happens most is that Silicon Valley, it's, it's a club like anything else. And if you don't look like what they expect you to look like, uh, then that goes against you. So an investor typically looks at pattern recognition. You know, I, I sort of have this emotional intelligence that tells me this person seems to have the same traits that I observed in a younger Mark Zuckerberg. And those things build over time, and after 10 or 20 years of investing, you, you get really good at recognizing some of the uh, features that you expect to see in those really awesome founders that are going to change the world. Because you haven't seen a lot of women in the past, you have no way of applying that pattern recognition to the very few founders who are female that you have seen uh, going through your office. So that's one of the reasons why you know, women in Silicon Valley may have a hard time. Also, uh, many of these partnerships, as I said, are very homogeneous. They are not only just men, but they're usually the same age group, and they're also pretty much all white. So getting into a partnership with like 30 or 40 partners um, who are all white, 50, and male, you know, it becomes really hard for women to get in. So if you look at the stories of Silicon Valley, um, there are some, some stories that I will tell you, like I wa if I watched uh, Mad Men and I like, went to meetings in Silicon Valley, Mad Men would be more progressive than Silicon Valley <laughs> sometimes. Like literally, like you would, I have met founders um, who have gone to pitch to investors in Silicon Valley uh, with a team of women and this is true story. Like they would be told that next time they should bring a man to bring more credibility to the story, like independent of the product or the pitch, be because women don't have the credibility in front of these VCs. Um, women have done uh, personal kind of st studies um, uh, correlating what they were to a certain meeting, you know, like skirts or dresses versus pantsuits and whether they would get yeses, yeses or noes. And they found some correlations that were reflected um, from what they were to these meetings. Um, I personally, you know, when I got married, I had people uh, in my board sit down with me and ask me whether I would be qualified to continue to be to being CEO of my company. Because, you know, if you get married, he said, you will change your priorities. You may have kids, and that may prevent you from being CEO. And that's the first time I found out that getting married changes your brain chemistry and you lose neurons, apparently. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, 
And so these things happen on a daily basis, and it's a really big problem in Silicon Valley. Um, it, we are behind the times in, in terms of even boards. Uh, if you go to a typical Fortune 100 company, you have at least 15, 20% uh, women in those companies. In Silicon Valley, it's less than 5% of uh, board members who are female. Um, so it's, it's a huge problem. However, I see this as an opportunity, and that's where actually my VC uh, firm is basing its thesis. There are 80% of the consumers in the US are women. And if you look at all the trends in technology, most of the trends that are relevant today are powered by women, who are the fastest adopters. They're usually the first uh, group that will uh, make your product viral. Uh, and they make the decisions on whether your product will go to the homes of American consumers. So if you do actually focus on products that change the lives of women and you invest in them, uh, you can make money a lot faster because the rest of Silicon Valley doesn't really realize what's out there. So uh, we have applied this thesis. We have uh, invested in 14 companies. And out of these 14 companies, um, a third of them made more than $10 million of revenue in less than a year after we invested in those companies. That's really rare in Silicon Valley. You usually need two or three years to even break even, right? Um, it has and been proven, too, that, that companies with at least one um, woman on the founding team perform statistically significantly better than yes. those without, too. Yes, that has, I mean, not just so. women, but diversity in general yeah. will bring you more success, financial success to your company. So, you know, I painted a really grim picture, but the, the truth is that this actually creates uh, really huge opportunities in the market, and women and female entrepreneurs and investors um, have uh, a special space or room in Silicon Valley to, yeah. to succeed. We can do the last question, and then we are going to stick around for, for those who want to discuss hey things guys. offline. Uh, yeah. Just what's, uh, when, when you have an idea, what's the right time to pitch it to a VC or take it to a shark tank? What's like when you have an idea. Yeah, so your, your question is how to pitch it? Yeah, no, w w when is the right time to take when? it to a VC or take it to a shark tank, right, where you pitch your idea and get funding? Yeah, so, so that's some of the things that we work a lot with, with first-time entrepreneurs and kind of maturing those, those ideas. And there has been a lot of a shift based on what I talked about a little bit in the beginning, that it's so much cheaper today to start a business. It's so much cheaper to get your product off the ground, to build a physical model on a 3D printer, or to set up a beautiful landing page. You don't need any coding skills. Uh, you, you can get away just spending a few hundred, a few thousand bucks on actually having something done that looks really professional. So the requirements, typically also in an, in an earlier round of funding, are also that much higher, right? Because if you haven't even been out and talked to your early customers, if you haven't tried to put together an MVP of some sorts, then it seems like you're not that driven. It seems like you're not that uh, proactive and, uh, and willing to pursue this, at least to some extent. So you, you want to get, you don't need to have a fully functional product before you start uh, uh, pitching your idea to various types of people, but, but you definitely need to do your homework, do your market research, like put together a, 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 some kind of, of canvas type of model and then start uh, analyzing those different assumptions that you have, talking to different customers, and then figure out who you want to pitch to, right? If it's super early stage, it doesn't make sense to pitch to a VC who typically invests uh, from an institutional uh, type of perspective a million dollars, five million dollars of funding. There's no way you're going to get access to that at that early stage. So maybe you instead want to try to pitch uh, an accelerator program where you can get $20,000 in funding. And really what you need right now is a lot of mentorship and support and resources and like-minded people to help you out. So also figure out like, because those, those types of accelerator programs take super early stage ideas and that's okay. Um, but if you talk to somebody like Rebecca and you just have an idea, um, that wouldn't be so. So know your audience, I'd say, would, would be key. Yeah, and uh, the crude truth is that it depends on who you are. If you are Max Lefton, co-founder of PayPal, um, when he has an idea, he will just go and talk to an investor and they will put money on him. And many of the people that raise money in Silicon Valley, this is going to make you angry, they don't have decks, they don't have any prototypes, they just go and talk to people because they have a lot of social validation. So if your track record and social validation is really high, then you don't need a lot of 
in, you know, a materialization of the idea to get traction in terms of investments. If you don't have a lot of social validation, you're, you are a new name in Silicon Valley, then you want to have as much freaking traction as you can get. Like, have revenue, have the team figured out, have all the partnerships and even letters from your customers who say that they're going to buy your 10,000 products. Um, so it's really that tension between uh, how well recognized you are as an entrepreneur versus um, the traction that you have. And in that pitch, I mean, as we talked about before, investors will look for low risk, high return. And as much as you can do to de-risk that opportunity, right, either by finding people that are super credible, right, as part of your funding team or as part of the advising team or some of the early investors, that will de-risk the opportunity. If you don't have any of that, yeah, how can you de-risk it? By proving there's a big market, by proving that, uh, that you are the right person to, uh, to make that in. Or get like a, a crowdfunding campaign going or something that can prove that traction. I think that's, uh, that's it for, uh, for now. It's been a real pleasure uh, working with you this evening. And thanks for all the great questions. And uh, we hope to stay in touch. Emails are up here. Thanks, guys. <laughs>